So thank you for coming. And those of you who aren't smiling, you'll be smiling when it's time to go. Uh, and so I, um, I, my husband always says when we travel, Lynn, take a picture, hurry up, let's go. You can look at it when you get home. That's what I'm going to tell you today. Uh, and you don't even have to take the picture because we will post this for you later. So just sit back, smile, relax, and we'll get through this together. <laughs> so I want to start, um, not with me, with the evolving scholarly record. And we have several subtopics within this. We have the research data management and the research information management. And as much as we love acronyms, it's RDM and RIM. And we have a very robust research agenda, and we have some great research scientists working on this. And you probably recognize most of them. Uh, Chris Sear is our newest addition to our research team. He came from um, Eastern Kentucky University. His PhD is in political science. And um, he earned his PhD at the uh, University of um, Colorado Boulder. And I, we really wanted someone who could work with large data sets. And he's the person. And so with the evolving scholarly record, um, we started out looking and identifying patterns and trends of how scholarly communication, that written record, has changed or is evolving. And from that came another series of reports um, called um, The Realities of RDM. And we have had webinars. We, and some of you, anyone here, have you participated in the RDM webinars? Oh, one person. Thank you. Come on, get with the program. Um, and so um, 80 of our members, RLP members, and you probably all know about RLP, our research library partnership, 80 of our members participated in these webinars, the, the interest groups, and it's been very robust. And so we're going to continue working in these areas and continue involving um, all of our partners. So what's coming in RDM? Um, Eshel Faniel is working with others at um, the University of Michigan, and they are working on um, context from the data re reuser's point of view. So they're looking at data reuse. And um, the, the, this article was accepted for publication in the Journal of Documentation, and so um, we, you should be looking for that. That should be out soon. Um, there, um, Michelle and Chris are also looking at uh, these other aspects. So what metadata elements exist in data deposit documentation and how consistently are they ap applied across repositories within a discipline? And how similar are data deposit requirements between disciplines? Michelle's research involves actual scholars. So she's working with um, archaeologists and others in the field. And so we have firsthand data from those um, who are, who are um, providing the research data for us. Now this is RIM, our research information management. And, and Rebecca Bryan is leading this. Um, and you will see that the first report there was a position paper, and that came from an RLP, Research Library Partners, uh, a discussion group. And then we also have several other publications um, that are out now, reports. Um, these are some, this is in more detail. Again, I am not going to go into a lot of detail, but you'll see that uh, we have a uh, actually partnered with others. So we've worked with Chris, the current research information system, uh, the research networking system, research profiling system, and faculty activity reporting. Don't you love all of these acronyms? So they're all right there for you. And um, you'll see that the, this is a quote, that RIM serves as a central source of research information for use by other systems, therefore reducing, eliminating duplication of efforts and research investment within the institution. Um, we also are looking at open access and open content in libraries. And um, we have a group working on this. 
And this is, um, we really want to know, it's from a very broad scope. And we want to know the full range of freely available, unrestricted online content, um, the target group, all types and sizes of libraries from across the globe. Um, and as I think about this, I think of my mother who works in, who used to work in retail, who says um, one size fits um, none. Um, but we're going to hone in on this, trust me. Uh, and you'll see we, um, uh, Rachel Frick has uh, done a next blog post about this and talking about what does open mean. And so I think that's something you might want to read. It doesn't take a whole lot of time, but it'll give you an overview. We really, we have this survey out there. So it's the snowballing effect. So what we're doing is we're asking individuals to participate in this survey, forward it on to others. So please feel free to take the survey. Uh, it's, it closes uh, January 31st, so you have time. Uh, that's Thursday. So um, please uh, help us. Uh, this is a project that I'm involved in, uh, researching students' information choices. I don't know if any of you stopped by the spotlight. I see Kathy. Um, I don't know if any of you stopped by the spotlight that we did on Saturday, but we went into detail about this, so I won't have much time today to talk about it. It's with um, Rutgers University, University of Florida, and it's funded by the IMLS. It is um, actually a four-year project. We had to ask for an extension. Uh, we have collected data from 174 individuals from fourth grade through graduate school. And we provide them with a simulation and they're STEM student, students. And we ask them, would you use this for your research project? Why or why not? And they have to put it into these buckets. So they're actually doing a think aloud, telling us why they're selecting it, why they are not. Because we're trying to determine credibility. One of the things that we've learned is without the container, we're calling this container collapse, without knowing what that container is. So we usually know this is a book, this is a magazine, this is a newspaper. But without knowing that container, it's very difficult for individuals to identify what actually an item is. What is that format? And so uh, we are learning a lot. We ask students how confident they feel selecting online information um, for research projects. And as you can see, that we have pretty confident, very confident for about three-fourths four, three of the individuals. And the blue line are the K through 12, and the orange line are the adults. Then we ask them the importance of knowing the container. And you'll see that it decreases as you get into the elementary school. So that container aspect decreases with the younger. Uh, there's this, this line, as I said, that blurs between what what something really is. And we need to have cues online. And often we wipe away all of those cues. And so we need to think about that when we're developing our library web pages. Um, we also did an internal report on discovery and access. And so um, what we did is um, we looked at um, WMS and we looked at the logs for academics. And you'll see here, um, we, can, we have an idea from the logs when individuals want physical access to, to items and when they want online access to items. So the physical are that darker blue and the burgundy are the online. Uh, then we looked at average session lengths in minutes by type of academic user. So we have community, four year, and ARL. Um, we also have the average number of searches per session. Uh, we also have the average number of words. The ARLs have the largest, have the, the greatest number of words per search by, on average. Why? You're looking at me quizzically. Because they're usually using our discovery systems, not for discovery, but for location. They already have a title, they know what they want, and they'll put in the entire title. 
Um, when you look at um, the percent of sessions that have requests, you'll see again the physical access option, the online access option, the attempt to save. Um, we call that, that's that green line, that's squirreling. Um, people squirrel away information and then they don't know where they put it and they usually can't find it again. How many of us do that? Yeah. I do that with food when I travel. I'm terrified I'm going to starve. And so I squirrel away. And then when I'm starving and I pull something out, it says 2015 is the expiration date. And that's what we do with our information. Um, these are some of the coding themes that came out of this project. We did interviews, and I can't go into it now, it's a whole paper, but we tried a method that we could not find in any of the lit LIS literature or the computer science literature. We took logs, and then we had individuals say, we had a pop-up, will you talk to us about this log? And then we interviewed them about the log. Some of these logs were a minute. So I'm looking at these and saying, this is going to be a snooze fest to talk to this individual, OK? It was a failed search. They didn't get what they wanted. Guess what? We talked for 45 minutes to an hour. It was not that they did not find what they wanted. It's that they went to the stacks. It's that they went outside of the library systems and found it elsewhere. And so that's leading us to our new project, and we may be asking some of you to help us recruit graduate students and faculty. We want to know how they get those items, that fulfillment now. And that's something we're going to look at next. Um, you know, do they go, do they come to the library to ask the library to purchase it? Do they go and ask um, someone else? Do they go to a Libris? Do they go to Amazon? Do they go to the local bookstore? Um, the implications for this um, are that um, librarians and um, library instruction can enhance the search and experience. When we interviewed the 15 individuals, they all mentioned librarians. And let me tell you, this does not happen very often. And they all talked about, a librarian told me how to do this. Um, this is why I did X, Y, or Z. Or Z. Too many results, overwhelming, very frustrating. And convenience is number one. But convenience is a moving target because it's dependent upon the context and the situation. Right now, you're using your phones, your, your tablets, but if you go into your office, you're probably using a laptop or a desktop. So things change depending on your need. Um, we decided to take the Digital Visitors and Residents Project to the public library arena, um, and we um, also, uh, and to not only look at the digital environment, but the face-to-face, -face, because we know that libraries are an important part of the community. And also, we are studying, uh, through an IMLS grant, public libraries' response to the opioid crisis. So very quickly, this is the visitors and residents model. Um, it's not how much time you spend online in a digital environment. It's um, how present you are in that environment. Are you lurking? Can we see you? Are you posting? Think about Facebook, um, Twitter, uh, Instagram. And most people are probably in that center, and it's probably dependent upon the context and situation. Um, we're looking at infrequent users at Worthington Public Library in, um, in Ohio. It's a suburb of Columbus. And the librarian said, we know what our frequent users are doing and want, but we need to learn about our infrequent users. And some of the questions we asked is, why do you choose the library for information? Um, what surprised you? What delighted you? What frustrated you? Um, the question I loved but is intense, so if you ever ask this, be ready. Um, what life-changing events do you anticipate in the next year? And then how can the library help you with these changes? And, and I'll tell you, it gets very emotional. Um, but it's really good because it comes from the heart and we hear what they need from the library. And what we heard a lot of was that, that community. They need a place to have a community for very specific things. Um, men going through divorce, not knowing how to take care of themselves, not knowing how to find real estate, 
Um, so these things came up. Women of all different um, life ages and, and different um, points in their lives talking about, I want to get back in the workforce. How do I do that? Who can I talk to? Who can help me? Um, these are the most popular activities um, in the library. Um, and this is a sample of 1,556 individuals. And this was in an online survey. They use the catalog most. Um, they return books. They check out books. They return items or reserved items. Most popular non-library activities. They search topics online. They search um, business online, they search programs online, they pay bills. So we were trying to find out what they do in their personal lives and how, and outside of the library and how maybe the library can help them in other ways. Um, this is some modeling that my colleague Chris did. Um, and so it's uh, the, ch the chance that respondents who shop for books, movies, or video games in the past week would um, their chance of them doing that based on the last time they ask a librarian for reading recommendations. So you'll see that 46% of the individuals asked a librarian for reading information and they were most likely to be the ones who shopped for books, movies, or video games as well to purchase. Um, the implications, libraries and other online services are complementary to each other. Checking out physical items still remains a very vital part of the library service. And many library users like to put roots within the library as a physical space. We heard that a lot in the interviews as well. Um, we also have this project that we are just starting to collect um, data. And it's to look at public libraries and how they support their community during this opioid crisis. And um, it, it, they're only public libraries who are actually addressing, um, uh, are actually collaborating with other community services. So either um, public health or um, the environmental off protection office, something like that. We, this is a 16 month project. We, this is our timeline and we hope we will be disseminating um, information and have a white paper out in um, July and we'll dis disseminate the information November through December of next year. And this is, if you want more information, you can con look at these areas. And next, I am going to turn it over to my colleague, Betha, and she's going to talk to you a little about, uh, about learning spaces. Will you hold your questions and comments until the end, and then just we'll ask you to go to the microphone. So thank you again for your attention, and Betha, it's all yours. Great. Well, thank you all. I'm Beth Aguchi. I'm with the Web Junctions Program at OCLC. And we work primarily with a focus on public libraries, in particular small and rural libraries. But we learn so much from them that we think has really broad applications. So I want to share with you some of what we learned by doing a design thinking process with a number of small libraries. How many people here are familiar, have heard of design thinking? Okay, maybe half the room. Um, it's essentially, it boils down to, it's a process of discovery and experimentation. It comes from industry and architecture where they're focused on um, really considering a more open-minded approach to the possibilities around designing things or buildings, but it's now been applied very broadly to designing services and all kinds of interactions with communities. There's uh, IDEO, I-D-E-O is um, a, a website to confer with if you really want to learn more about it. They created a design thinking for libraries toolkit, which really walks through a process. We began using that toolkit for a project that we did with small libraries and realized that we really wanted to streamline it to make it really applicable for places that had limited staff and limited time. Uh, but it's really about discovering what your communities want 
and then experimenting, being very open in terms of how you meet those needs and how you can adjust and revise as you learn more about how the community is responding. There is a, a good application in across library field. There's a really good example from the University of Miami where they applied design thinking to meet the need, information needs of their students by forming cross-functional teams with the students, so this is collaborating with community, and uh, to really understand their patterns of behavior, and then providing services in an experimental way that they would revise and adjust as they learned what was working and what was not working. So I am going to look more specifically and give you some examples from how we apply design thinking in a project that we did at Web Junction called um, Small Libraries Create Smart Spaces. This is a project that was funded by a grant from IMLS and by support from OCLC, in which we worked with 15 small or rural libraries from across the country. And because this was a grant-funded project, we had specific deliverables, so we defined a design challenge for them. Design thinking process tends to start with defining a challenge, um, and it's usually phrased in these how might we questions, how might we achieve, achieve some um, outcome or objective for our organization. So we provided the design challenge for our group of libraries, um, and it was around re rethinking, reconfiguring a physical space in their small libraries to engage members in active learning. So although we defined the challenge for them, we wanted to leave it very open-ended. So we provided a really broad definition of active learning, that it's essentially about that participatory, informal activity that's really driven by and relates to the interests of the people who are involved in it. Um, it's, what we wanted to avoid basically was we don't want everyone to come up with maker spaces because that's sort of what automatically comes to mind when you say active learning. But it's really about learning that happens by doing. It's literally hands on. It's social. It really enhances social connection because people are doing things together rather than doing it themselves. Learning. Uh, it sort of breeds other learning as people pick up tools and experiment. They find new pathways in learning. And as they're learning from each other, they're posing new problems to each other. So the process of active learning itself is very collaborational. And we wanted the um, libraries to really uh, encompass that as they went through this process of design thinking. So I'm going to go through three key phases, beginning with um, the connection, that community discovery piece. In design thinking terminology, this would be called the ideation, or the, sorry, the inspiration phase. And it starts with this mantra, the community is the expert. It is all about the community. And it's about discovering not just their needs, which sometimes uh, libraries will do a survey, what do they need, but really understanding what are their aspirations? What do they talk to each other about? What are they... Um, so where are their, their problems and what are their barriers to them having a more fulfilling life? Some of those questions that Lynn mentioned in the Worthington Public Library study are really appropriate to a community discovery process, like just really broadening, not what does the library do for you, but what do you need in your life? Um, there are a whole number of tools and activities that we apply, that others could apply, but really what matters more than the tools that you use is going into this process open-minded, suspending your preconceived notions of what the library can and can't do, and going out and genuinely listening. So being open and listening, and then seeing where you go from there. So a wonderful example from our smart space libraries, this was from um, a library that entered the project under the name of the Bertha Voyer Memorial Library in Texas. And the Patty May Mayfield, the director there, said she had been frustrated for years trying to get her board, trying to light a fire to get them to do something to update, upgrade, and modernize the library. And they just thought the status quo was fine. So she went through this process of going out into the community in several locations and collecting their ideas on colorful post-it pieces of paper, went to her board, said, I need 15 minutes with you. 
that turned into an hour and a half. Something just lit a fuse with that board when they saw all that input from the community on those colorful post-its, all those ideas. They decided to change the name to the Honey Grove Library and Learning Center. They changed their website, wrote a new mission statement, and they started a capital campaign to really update what was an old and crumbling physical infrastructure. Initial goal of 300000 as of December they had raised $649,000 to this goal. And we're still thinking, it's a little bit of mystery what really lit that fuse, but it, I think it had a lot to do with them hearing it directly from the people. That made such a difference to what the board was thinking. And this transformation was really echoed through some of our other um, project participants. You'd think in a small library, a small community, they know what their community needs and wants, but so many of them discovered new perceptions about their community that helped them rethink what they could do with them. So another key phase is the thinking, thinking expansively, and this is often a challenge in design thinking terms, this is called ideation. And it's taking all of that community input. Well, the community is not going to come up with a definitive, neat idea of what you should do. The tendency is for a library to take that input, go back to the library and say, OK, now we know what we need to do. The ideation phase, that expansion in the middle of that slide, it's where the library staff and key stakeholders, it's where they open up their thinking. And there's a whole brainstorming process that encourages you to suspend judgment, set aside all those responses of, oh, that's not practical, we can't afford it, that's not something the library does. You just throw all that out the window and explode with ideas. And what it does, of course, there are going to be lots of impractical things that come out, but what it does, it just opens up the perception to possibilities that might not have entered in before. So when we introduced this to our cohort, we had a little rebellion because they thought we heard the input, oh, we don't need this, um, but we, they were willing to try. We led them through the, the ideas and the process, and the leader of the rebellion gave us this quote in their evaluation that they're going to use this in future projects, so hooray. Um, and then going to another phase, which in design thinking terminology is prototyping. And this is really taking those ideas which are still on post-its or still in some abstract form and putting them into a tangible form that not only um, the library staff can see, but the community can see. And as you see, this is not high tech. This is cardboard. And I love the one in the middle because the, this library let their patrons create some of the proto prototypes. So that's a patron prototype where they thought, let's just be able to sit in the shelves, in the book stacks. And although the library didn't do exactly that, they did something along that lines of making the actual book shelving in this particular space in a way that the patrons can physically interact with it. Um, it's also prototyping doesn't have to be a scale model. You can prototype, oh, this, okay, this is one of the participants. There was a lot of hesitation around this also. Um, because this, they, they hadn't done this before. This is a new process. But once they got into it, it's like, you know, kids, you give them our arts and crafts to play with. Once they started doing it, they had a lot of fun doing it. Um, but it doesn't have to be the scale model. And I love this example from the Madison Public Library, very small community in South Dakota, where they wanted to create a teen space but they weren't sure if it would really work for the teens. So they, they were prototyping the commitment and capacity of the teens to really occupy space and um, interact with each other in the library. And the, the teens came to them and said, hey, how about if we stage a Harry Potter party? And the library said, OK, it's yours. And, and so they amazing group of teens did such a creative job of building all these props that really recreated that Harry Potter environment. They built um, games, designed games. They created these little snitches as prizes. They cooked treats that were along lines of the theme. So they fully demonstrated that they were ready and capable to occupy the space that was being created for them and lead programming, and that's exactly what they've been doing for the last year. There's also this wonderful example 
of allowing the community to build a space in the library. All of this process is about sharing power with your community. So really that collaboration that starts at the beginning with the community as the expert, but it continues throughout the whole process. And it is a relinquishing of power to some extent. Um, this is an example from Cornwall Public Library in New York where really this is all volunteer energy, community members who came in and created the space from designing it, choosing the furnishings, installing the fixtures and the electronics, laying the carpet. And I love the one in the lower right, these two teenage girls who want, they wanted, they came in and said, we want to paint a mural on that dark blue wall. And this is the finished space that is really partially created by the teens. It was designed to be a teen space and just uh, really demonstrating how successfully the teens are occupying that space and using it for their learning, they're active, they do study groups together, they have um, scavenger hunts that they stage and plan in this space. So it's really allowing that transformation to happen with the community and moving from designing or thinking what we're gonna do for the community to what are we gonna do with our community. So I encourage you all to think about how you might apply design thinking strategies to any problem or challenge in your library, no matter what type of library, what size. Um, think about these concepts and how it might apply. If you're interested, there are transformation stories from each of these 15, actually there are only 13 up there right now for, for various reasons, but there are 13 transformation stories from each of the libraries that we worked with and there are some brief videos that kind of bring some of that to life. And we also created a self-paced course based on the process that we led this group through. We worked with them for 15 months and uh, turn that process into a self-paced course so you can go to that link at the bottom and see what kinds of tools were used and how we led them through that process. So I encourage you to explore and I encourage you to really think broadly about design thinking and understand that it's really the essence, the essential part is that discovery and experimentation. So there are a lot of tools out there, but not to feel constrained by the tools, but to really focus on how can you genuinely discover your community's aspirations, do that explosive ideation process of how you might meet those, those aspirations, and then be willing to be very flexible and experimental in how you start delivering services and be ready to um, respond to input all the way along and revise and adjust as you need. So thank you very much, and I hope you check out the resources. So I'm Karen Smith Yoshimura. I'm with OCLC Research based in California. Um, and yes, I'm supposed to talk about OCLC Research and linked data, but frankly, there's a lot. So today I'm just going to point out, whoa, I, no, I'm not gonna point out that. You know what, it would help if, if I did this right side up. Yeah, well, this is not what we do in linked data. <laughs> Yes, what I wanted to point out were some highlights from just three of the initiatives that OCLC Research did last year in 2018. The third of our series of, on the International Linked Data Survey for Implementers, our work on the International Image Interoperability Framework, otherwise known as IIIF, and Project Passage, our Linked Data Wiki-based prototype. So some background on our International Linked Data Surveys. Um, the impetus for these surveys were discussions with our research library partners, metadata managers, who knew and were aware of a number of linked data projects out there, but felt there were many more out there that they should know about. So we designed together a survey instrument. We beta tested, beta tested it with a few of the early linked data implementers, and we conducted that survey in 2014. 
Um, our target audiences were those who had already implemented a linked data project or service or were in the process of doing so. And we asked questions both about publishing linked data and consuming linked data. So I reported those results in a series of posts on our Hanging Together blog. But as much as people said they appreciated it, they immediately, you know how librarians are, no matter how good it is, they immediately spot the weakness, the one point that's missing. And in this case, we were missing responses from some of the leading linked data implementers, especially the national libraries in Europe. So we repeated the survey in 2015, and I reported those results in the DLib magazine. And then three years pass, and you know, a lot of things change. So yes, we repeated the survey again in 2018, and my analysis of those results was published in Code for Lib um, journal in no last November. So altogether, in those three surveys, we re received a responses from um, 143 institutions in 23 countries. Most were, well not most, but 42% were from the United States with 60, followed by Spain, the UK, the Netherlands, Canada, and Germany. Um, in 2018, interestingly enough, the percentages didn't really change. We received 81 responses um, altogether and 42% were from the United States, followed by Spain, UK, the Netherlands, and Canada, and Germany. Can't forget Germany because we have a German in our midst. So um, we categorized these uh, institutions by type. So I'm going to quickly highlight the differences um, between the 2018 surveys and the previous ones. So you'll note that in the 2015, which is the um, middle bar, the second to the from the left, we did in fact increase the number of responses from national libraries and got about the same number. Um, in 2018. And given that we distributed the surveys on mostly library networks, um, no surprise that the two types that represented the majority of the responses were in fact research libraries and national libraries. But in 2018, for the very first time, we also received responses from service providers. These are organizations, institutions that provide linked data services on behalf of their customers. So that's one of the significant changes in 2018. So we also asked how long the linked data project or service was in produc production. Um, in 2018, altogether, we had 104 different linked data implementations described compared to 112 in 2015. Now, one interesting thing to remember, we had institutions that did respond to previous surveys, but they often described a different implementation than they did previously. So of those 104 linked data implementations, 42 had not been described previously. 75% of the linked data implementations are in production, slightly higher than reported in 2015. And interestingly, 40% of the linked data implementations described in 2018 had been in production for more than four years. So we do have quite a few mature linked data implementations now. So just among those that publish linked data, um, these are the top eight RDF vocabularies ontologies used. Um, it comparing, well, here I go again. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm clicker challenged. Um, so the blue line is the 2015 um, responses compared to 2018. You'll see that there's an increase in the use of both schema.org and BibFrame um, with decreases in SCOS and friend of a friend in particular. When we asked those who consume linked data, um, ID, the Library of Congress is ID.gov and the Virtual International Authority File, or VF, remain the top two resources consumed. Um, but the really amazing thing was the surge in the use of Wikidata, more than four times reported in 2018 compared to 2015. And we also note increases in the use of worldcat.org and ISNI. So going further quickly to um, our work on the IIIF, the International Image Interoperability Framework, 
Um, it is a consortium and it produces standards and OCLC is one of the 55 IIIF consortium members. Now the IIIF um, provides continued support for adoption, experimentation, outreach, and a thriving community of libraries, museums, software firms, scholars, and technologists working with IIIF. So it's a broad cross-domain consortium and it ha currently has four APIs, image, presentation, search, and authentication, and the one in, in development, which is discovery. So what we do in OCLC research, I wish I wouldn't do that. <laughs> Um, we de we developed a functional prototype for the IIIF presentation API and collaborated with our OCLC colleagues in production, um, from in product management, and incorporated that into our content DM service. And now we're prototyping, similarly, the IIIF discovery API. And we're actively collaborating not only with other OCLC colleagues, but also the content DM users group um, to prototype and test Triple I F integration. How many here are Content DM users? Oh, there's a good, I'd say almost half. Well, good news. Content DM is actually OCLC's first productionalized, supported, and used linked data service, supporting both the image and presentation APIs. Currently, with 45 million manifests. And what I show here is the incorporation of the IIIF presentation API um, in ContentTM using the Mirador viewer. And here's a sample from our prototyping of the IIIF data for discovery, this time providing cross collection searching across the University of Texas Austin's Harry Ransom Center's digital collections. So that's cool. And now, a word about Project Passage. So a quick overview, this, this pilot ran from December 2017 through September 2018. We had 16 OCLC member libraries participate in it. Um, the objective was to evaluate a framework, actually a sandbox for reconciling, creating and managing bibliographic and authority data as linked data entities and relationships. And we seeded um, the database, which was a Wikibase. Wikibase is the software infrastructure that supports Wikidata and all the Wikipedias. So the pilot Wikibase instance included 1.2 million entities that we ingested um, from the overlaps of WorldCat, BF, and Wikidata. So our focus, first and foremost, was on collaboration, the partnership with our OCLC. Sorry. Lena's warning me. I'm about to um, change the slide that I didn't want to say. I need that. Um, well, first and foremost was the partnership with all of the participants from those 16 libraries. Uh, we discussed use cases. Um, they went off and looked at what they c would normally describe and then presented them to us in different office hours. We held weekly office hours. We had monthly um, calls where we showed off the new enhancements we did often in response to the issues that they brought to us. And we used the OCLC Community Center as a way of threading not only our discussions, but also providing links to recordings of those sessions. Because let's face it, not everybody can make every meeting. And I'm sure you're familiar with that. Um, we did a reconciliation service. Um, Wikibase comes with a lot of nice features in bed that we didn't have to do anything about. But there are other features that it turned out we needed to accommodate and develop to accommodate the kinds of issues that the actual participants encountered. Um, we had a sparkle endpoint for complex questions and provided a whole list of sample um, queries that they could do. And one of the things, you know, that was really hard for most of us starting the first time in Mark, we're just not used to having one set of data being reused in another representation. We look at it item by item. And in a linked data entity based, you can reuse that. And it, you don't have to put it in the same place. So the Explorer application allowed us, everybody, to see the results and navigate the graph. And I'll show you the, the example of that in a little while. So we use the default Wikibase um, interface but then one of the biggest needs was to be able to take advantage of 
data that it was already existing somewhere else. So our team, our developers, created a retriever application to import data from other sources so people didn't have to duplicate the work over and over again. So basically, it's entity-based. You create linked data, and you don't have to learn all of the technical underpinnings. You know, most of the participants didn't know Turtle, didn't know RDF, didn't know what triples or predicates are. You don't have to do that. You focus on just the description, the statements, the properties, the relationships. The kinds of things you do in cataloging, but in a different way. Um, it, what I love, as people who know me are, are familiar with, I love multilingualism. And it comes already embedded in the Wikibase um, structure. So here's an example of Sun Yat-sen with an English interface. And it has English labels and English text. But if I change the interface to Chinese, now Sun Yat-sen becomes Sun Jun Shan. And I can just focus on the Chinese language in, um, data and, and uh, labels. So both of these point to the same identifier. So for a Chinese metadata specialist, you don't have to worry about transliterations anymore. You know, let somebody else do the transliteration. The English interface shows the transliteration in English. Somebody who knows Arabic could come in and do the Arabic transliteration. A Korean might put the Congo transliteration. There are many transliterations, but you can just focus on the language that you are most familiar with and not worry about the transliteration used by others. And this also replaces the whole concept of language of cataloging, which I think is really cool. Anyway, so with the Sparkle and queries, you can also choose visualizations. So what I've done here is retrieve all of the passage entities that had a translated from statement from Heidegger's Sign and Sight. So it's all plotted on a timeline. You can see all of the translations. You can choose which information is displayed. You can see how many times it's been translated, not only in different languages, but even in the same languages, but by different translators. So that's the visualization. But as I pointed out before, this reciprocal relationship, there's a Heidegger work, and it's been translated to many languages. But when you put it in an entity-based system, you only say sign and sight, or being in time, is an English translation translated from sign and sight. How do I know that I have all the relationships? This discovery layer, I pulled up sign and sight, the original German work. And then on the right, those are the same translations that I showed you in the previous slide, but they show up in the discovery layer so I can be sure that I made the correct con relationship connections. And it also pulls up information from other sources. In this case, there's a screen, um, an image of the title page of the French translation from the Wikimedia, Wikimedia Commons. And there's also an abstract pulled from DBpedia. So this also makes us think about how much of the free text, the narratives that we often put into MARC records, how much of that is really necessary if you have a chance to pull that information, maybe better information or more information from other sources. So the passage pilot participants did a number of case studies um, and showed them in these business hours and then raised all the issues that they had. So here we had one for a digital map, a poster for an event, the Everly Brothers, a picture of a postcard, a photograph, digitized photograph that was also part of a collection, and a music piece that was composed also in conjunction with an event. And each of those were written up. We discussed them, and often new properties, new features, uh, new functionality were added because of these use cases. So it's been a wonderful experience. Dare I say we had a lot of fun? That's really important. You want a project, you want to have fun doing it. So for more information, more information about all those three, plus a lot more, is on the OCLC research website at this URL, oc.lc slash linked data. And watch out for the upcoming report and project passage, which will include contributions from, from 12 of the project passage participants. And thank you.